Hello and welcome. What you're looking at right now is a new intersection design that I've been thinking about that I call the double T junction. And I'm going to show you why it's such a game changer and how we can take advantage of it to radically improve city traffic. When I first tried this out in computer simulations, I was very surprised by just how well the traffic flowed, much better than it did before. So I started looking into why it's such dramatic improvement over what we have at the moment. Eventually, I came up with these seven different reasons why this new intersection can revolutionize city traffic. After that, I take a look at a few of the problems and worries that people might have with this new concept. Let's begin by looking at how many traffic light phases we have and compare it with a few traditional intersections. First, let's look at a typical intersection for two-way roads. Here we need to have five traffic light phases in total. That's one for each traffic direction and one for pedestrians. And drivers have a choice of three different exit directions to choose from. Next, we have the traditional intersection for one-way roads. This intersection improves on the last one by having just three traffic light phases, one for each of the two directions and one for pedestrians. The downside though is that it doesn't give the driver the same number of direction choices. That's down from three to two. Finally, we have the double T junction. Now we have just two phases, one for traffic and one for pedestrians, but we still have the same number of direction choices as the traditional one-way intersection, two. Overall then, at first glance, this might not seem like a big improvement, moving from three phases to two. But the important thing for traffic flow is the number of phases for vehicles, and we've cut that in half, going from two to one. And it turns out this causes a massive reduction in the average traffic light wait times. What do I mean by this? Well, it's the average time a random driver will have to wait at a traffic light. I'll start by looking at a common two-way traffic intersection first. If you arrive at the worst time, you'll be waiting almost a minute. Later drivers will have shorter wait times, and some drivers won't need to wait at all. Then if we calculate the average wait time across the entire traffic light cycle, it will typically work out to be about 22 seconds. Next, we have the one-way intersection. Now, reducing the number of traffic light phases from 5 to 3 causes the average wait time to be reduced down to about 12 seconds. Finally, then, we have the double T junction, with just one phase for vehicles now. We see a reduction in the average wait times to under one second. Now, these average wait times are representative of generic traffic light setups. I go through the details of how I get these numbers in my other videos. And real world examples will of course be different, but they should be quite similar. Next, I think I need to address the question of intersection safety. The double T junction with its four lanes of traffic traveling towards each other before turning away at the last minute will look pretty unsafe at first glance. But if we add barriers, we can make these intersections safer than any intersections we have at the moment. Now, unfortunately, that's because our existing intersections are not at all safe. There are lots of different statistics out there, but roughly half of injury causing accidents occur at intersections. But if you had a double T junction with these improvements, you all but eliminate the worst types of collisions, namely head on and T bone collisions between two vehicles. And the double T junction is not just safer for drivers. If we move the pedestrian crossings, we can allow pedestrians to cross the roads by crossing the now unused center of the intersection. This has a few effects. Firstly, this alternative arrangement greatly reduces the area where pedestrians are exposed to traffic, cutting it almost in half. Next, we also reduce the total number of lanes that pedestrians will have to cross. Finally, as a bonus, if the intersection is large enough, it also has the effect of turning the center of the intersection into a usable public space. So what about the intersection throughput? When the traffic lights are green, how many lanes of traffic can pass through the intersection at a time? Well, we have one lane at a time for the traditional two-way traffic intersection then two lanes at a time for the traditional one-way intersection. 
Then we have four lanes at a time for the double T junction. That's a massive improvement on the status quo. But there's more to intersections than just raw throughput. And that's how the lanes leading to the intersection match up with the lanes leading away from the intersection. To explain this, I'm going to use the idea of lane mathematics. So again, let's start with the conventional two-way traffic intersection. If you look at how the lanes are configured, when the traffic light is green, you have one inbound lane feeding into three outbound lanes. So even if all the outbound lanes were empty or moving continuously, you could at most only make use of one third of the capacity of those outbound lanes. That's a very inefficient use of valuable road space. With the conventional one-way intersection, again, things improve a bit. Now you have two inbound lanes leading to four outbound lanes. So this time you could make use of up to 50% of the outbound lanes capacity. Then you have the double T junction, which has four inbound lanes and four outbound lanes. So the inbound lanes could make use of 100% of the capacity of those outbound lanes, if those lanes keep moving, that is. The next challenge then is how do we keep our outbound lanes moving so that we are able to make full use of all that excellent intersection capacity? Well, we just make sure that the next intersection along is also a double T junction. Drivers just change lanes anywhere between intersections to affect where they want to go. Adding more intersections, we make it so the drivers can circle a city block and they can change lanes to circle around neighboring city blocks. We end up with what I like to call the double T grid where drivers can get from any street to any other street quickly and easily using safer and much higher throughput intersections, all while stopping much less frequently and for much less time. So you're probably thinking there must be some problems and drawbacks. Well, yes, there are, and it's time I started talking about a few of these. You can see a list of the main problems on screen here might seem like quite a lot at first, but these are some very new ideas, and when you examine the problems more closely, it's not nearly as bad as it first looks. Now I've got a separate video that goes through all of these problems and more in detail, but after making that video I realised I could have put them into three different categories. Real problems, problems that are not as bad as they look, and not actual problems at all. So check out that video if you want all the details of these problems and not just a quick summary. But for now, I'll just pick out a few of the more informative examples. Like, uh, what about infrastructure rollout? The double T junction is going to need fixed barriers to be safe. So would that mean that large sections of a city would need to be shut down for weeks or months at a time to make these changes? Well, no, and for two reasons. Firstly, a lot of the infrastructure could be prefabricated, cutting down a lot on that construction time. And two, if you already have a one-way system, it's possible to change over to a double T grid in small increments of just a couple of intersections at a time. Next. What about the apparent problem of longer journeys? This is one of the key things to understand about the double T grid, because journeys will on average be longer in terms of the distance traveled. But crucially, those journeys will take less time. I've got another video that goes into detail on this point, where I analyze and compare different types of grids. So why did I think I needed a whole video? Well, I think it's easy to understand that if traffic lights stop you for less often, and when they do stop you, it will be for less time, that will make your journeys take less time. The thing that wasn't clear to me before working on that video was the question, will the time saved by using double T junctions make up for the extra distance that drivers will have to cover in a double T grid? And it turns out the answer is yes. Even though you will have to travel a longer distance, you will be able to do it in less time. A related point is that 
even though the average journey will take less time, people will probably also be concerned about the extra fuel consumption that longer distances will require. But with those traffic lights again, you will have much less stop-start driving, which should greatly improve fuel efficiency. Another apparent problem that people might struggle with at first is how do drivers transition from a conventional road or city grid onto a double T road or grid? Well, with a traditional one-way system, it's very easy. We just convert certain streets and intersections and the double T grid will fit right in. Uh, I've got a lot more about this in my problems video. Okay, so what about two-way streets? And there we have a few different options. We can have free-flowing intersections that cut down on the number of direction choices that are possible. Or we can use traffic lights, which will slow drivers down a bit, but also give them more options. It turns out that once you become accustomed to the idea of a double T junction, you'll start to see that there are a lot of possible variations on the double T junction. Now I've got a whole video dedicated to introducing these variations, so check that out if you want to see more. Okay, so all of this is a lot to take in for one short video. I've no idea how people are going to react to getting all of these ideas in one go. For me, after getting the initial idea, I tried it out in the city simulator game City Skylines and was very surprised by just how well the traffic flowed. But after that, learning about the double T junction was a gradual process for me. And the more I learned, the more I realized that these ideas can be used to make a difference in the real world. And to that end, I've made a few more videos that go far beyond this introduction and will hopefully answer the many questions that people might have. I've mentioned a few of these already. The first one detailing the problems with these ideas, then a more technical one that analyzes and compares different types of city grids, and one that goes through the many different types of double T junctions that are possible. But apart from those, I've also got one on introducing these ideas using the city simulation game Cities Skylines. And another City Skylines focused one that walks through how I developed these ideas and also looks at some possibilities for future grid configurations. But of course, it's unlikely that I've answered all the possible questions that people might have. So in the future, I hope to make another video on the common questions that people have that I haven't answered yet. So hit the subscribe button if you want to see that when it comes out and hit the like button if you think this video deserves it. So I'll leave you now with a few more previews of my other videos.